thank you everyone. Hi, um, Samsung folks. It's really my pleasure to have an opportunity to um, come here and share some of our research. Um, and thank you very much for attending this talk. Um, so in today's talk, I'll um, first give an introduction to, um, since many of you may not know, know me or our school, so I'll quickly give an overview of uh, Northwestern University. And then uh, we'll go through two different uh, uh, directions that our lab are currently looking into as a novel um, architecture and circuit solutions to accelerate the modern machine learning tasks. So, um, and at the end, I'll uh, stay here to, to address some questions you may have. Okay, um, so let me get started. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you have been to uh, Chicago. And uh, Northwestern, we are located in the, in the northern uh, suburb of Chicago. Uh, we, are, uh, we, we are pretty good ranking in the US news. We also have a pretty strong engineering uh, school among all the private schools. Uh, in the ECE department, that's where I'm in, uh, we have about 35 faculty members and we have two divisions, uh, which is the electrical engineering division and computer engineering division. So I'm in computer engineering and we do, uh, we, uh, do research on the VRSI, uh, CAD, architecture and the embedded system. So here I'm showing a map. I don't know how many of you maybe get a degree in the Midwest, you may be familiar with this region. Um, we actually have many good schools around this region. Uh, so we are in the, you see the northern part of the Chicago. And uh, um, on the north, we have Wisconsin, we have Minnesota, we have UIUC, Purdue, Michigan. So a lot of good schools. So I actually encourage you to come to, you know, our Midwest and uh, recruit uh, students. We have a lot of good students here. Uh, on the right side uh, is a, a, a picture of a campus. We actually have very nice campus here. Um, you, you can see we're right located at, at, uh, um, next to the Lake Michigan. So we have very nice um, lake view here. So um, yeah, just um, as I mentioned, we have one of the most beautiful campus, you know, in the uh, um, uh, um, uh, US. And uh, we are in a town called Evanston, which is about 30 minutes um, north of downtown Chicago. So this is, we are, so we can actually enjoy a pretty, you know, quiet suburb neighborhood to, you know, to stay with our school and study, do the research. Well, at the same time, we can have a nice city life if you prefer. So here I show some pictures. Um, uh, actually, you see on the right, this is our school campus. We, um, we can actually, we can see the, uh, uh, we can see the, the, the skyline of, of Chicago downtown. So we have a very beautiful campus. Uh, that's a quick introduction to our school and uh, this is myself. I think uh, Catherine already introduced me. So I worked uh, in fact uh, six years in industry. So I was in text instruments. I worked on the OMI processor. I don't know some, maybe some of you still remember it. I, I think it's still um, on the market. So I worked on the uh, research on the ultra low power, ultra low voltage design of the mobile processor. And then I joined Max Linear and uh, work on mixing you know, broadband uh, communication IC. I joined Northwestern from 2015. So I've been here uh, about uh, almost six years. Um, this is our group. We have uh, about six PhD students. Um, as you know, we are um, we, we tape up chips. So we are pretty busy all the time, uh, but when we are not so busy, we try to you know, have some fun together you know, enjoy the life together with my students. Um, here, I wanna give a, a little bit quick review on our research um, uh, before I get into um, a lot of details. So as you can see here, we, we cover pretty much the full stack of the hardware development all the way down from the transistor level circuit and up to the system. So at the transistor level, um, we de developed some uh, very, I think, very interesting and novel circuit technique to accelerate um, modern computing tasks. For example, um, some machine learning tasks that we do. So we leverage uh, analog mixed signal computing technique. So one of the topics I'm going to share today will be on the computing memory that we will 
um, we we just uh, um, we, we just delivered. Um, on the architecture side, we do we develop uh, we explore some interesting architecture um, choices for CPU, GPU, and also accelerator. And again, in today's talk, I'm going to talk about one of our very recent work. Um, we call it neural CPU, which is a reconfigurable architecture. So I'm going to talk more into that. And we try to leverage our uh, chief design expertise to go into the system level and build an entire system device. So uh, we try to build, uh, leverage our ultra low power um, chip, which is also empowered by the machine learning core in it to build a um, you know, new generation of human machine interface device and also biomedical device. So we, so we leverage our, our chip to build the system and hopefully that can you know, help improve people's uh, users' quality, uh, the life quality, and also the quality of the patient who suffer from different health conditions. So that's a uh, quick overview of our, our, research, um, uh, our research topics. Um, so, so this is, you know, uh, we are a chip uh, uh, group. So we do uh, several tape outs every year. And uh, over the years, we already built a lot of different, uh, you know, techniques in our group. And in today's talk, I'm gonna focus on the bottom two, which is a very the most recent work from our group. So uh, we designed a very special architecture we call neural CPU. This is just got published in Micro 2020, uh, which is uh, two months ago. And then we have a, a I'm gonna talk about the computing memory design. Which just got accepted into ICC, so we're going to present in uh, in uh, next month's um, ICC conference. Um, okay, so uh, without further ado, we I'm going to um, get into the technical discussion. So in the first topic, I want to share um, is uh, 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 I think it's very special architecture we are trying to work on. And we're trying to use a neural network to do something that the people do with the general purpose computing. So um, let me show why we want to do it and what we can deliver in here. Um, well, I think I don't have to give too much introduction as you all know, and many of you probably are working on it, that the, nowadays the AI chip actually seeing a rapid growth in the market. And, and also, we're not just talking about the, the high-end, you know, high-performance computing chips used for data center or the desktop. We also are talking about the AI chip that is used in the edge device or even IoT device. So as I'm showing here, projected by Deloitte, that uh, the edge AI, AI computing market is projected to reach $70 billion in five years. So that's a big market. And what's important here is, of course, the low power, low cost, and also real time capability. I'm going to talk about that later. And people already show, uh, if you look at the recent uh, solid state the conference, people already demonstrate a lot of very low power, really low power IoT type of embedded device or chip that can perform the CNN operation. So definitely, there's a lot of uh, development and also opportunities at the low power end for the AI type of chip. Now, uh, I wanna introduce our motivation for, do this work, for, for doing this work, which is really some challenges that we see in, the developing, uh, in developing the resource constraint and edge AI devices. Um, so, so this will be our typical architecture as you see on the screen that we normally have a CPU and have an accelerator. We need the accelerator because the performance or the, uh, the latency, the requirement of real-time operation really need a special purpose accelerator to, to finish the job in time. But it's very hard to uh, maintain the balance between the cost and the uh, power and also performance, especially when the performance is very stringent. And here, what I want to highlight is the latency, which unfortunately, I think a lot of time are under uh, are overlooked. Um, so here I'm showing an example on the screen on the uh, right bottom of figure. 
This is our collaboration with Ron Shirley Ability Lab, which used to be uh, Chicago a Rehab Center of Chicago, which is the largest rehab hospital in the, um, um, in the world. So what they do is they build a special hardware device to assist the people or the patient who lost their limbs. So what they do is put a large amount of sensors, uh, such as EMG sensors or, or, or string sensors, uh, uh, and, and also um, basically all kind of different sensors that can detect people's motion. And overall, there will be uh, 40 to 70 channels. Um, all the all the sensor signal has to be collected and then passed through very intensive computing tasks, for example, uh, many different um, uh, feature extraction jobs to convert into features and then pass through a machine learning, um, basically, um, for, example, deep learn, um, for example, deep neural network uh, uh, to, to basically classify people's intention or movement right, before they even make the, the movement, the, we have to classify what people do. And then after you classify their movement, you have to send it into a robotic device, this kind of prosthetic device to, to trigger the motor and uh, help people to, to perform the operation. And all these operations have to be finished within five to 10 to 15 minutes second. So if you go beyond that, the user start to feel lagging and also feel inconvenienced. And that's, that means this large amount of channels, let's say 70 channels, information has to be, be processed, be sensed and processed and also classified within this short period of time. And this create a lot of requirement in the latency of the operation. And, um, and also because of heavy duty, a uh, heavy computing need, um, the battery size also very big, which added the weight into the, into the user. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of time when we look at these conference papers, we, people really like on the TOPS or TOPS for what, but that doesn't reflect the latency sometimes because you can, in fact, hide the latency. So what I want to point out here is the end-to-end -end performance is actually very critical. You, um, especially for low-power devices where you don't have a huge number of you know, batch of images to run, uh, so you really have to finish a particular job within a certain amount of time. In that case, actually, both the CPU and the accelerator are very critical. And sometimes I think the end-to-end -end performance are not very intensively discussed in, in, the, in the study. Um, another challenge, as I'm showing here, is actually the utilization of the accelerator. Again, this is we are putting into the context of the resource constraint the edge device. So I'm showing here that uh, on, the, on some of our you know, um, 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 the, the, the survey of some of the publication that people have made is recently, you can see there's a big portion of the operation actually are operated by the CPU, uh, the, by the CPU who need to do the pre-processing job. And the accelerator and the CPU are not really well balanced. And this, this means if you have, a, for example, low number of features, uh, low number of images to process, your accelerator has to wait and your CPU to finish. So you have a lot of idle time. And this become, become some, sort, some, sort of, some sort of a dilemma. Um, you need, we need a CN uh, or some, we need an accelerator to help maintain the performance and the latency. But on the other hand, we, it's very, very costly to put into our edge device. And also sometimes it's underutilized, right? Because a lot of time we, we could be bottlenecked by all the sensor speed. And this is the issue for the low cost IoT type of device. And, 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 and actually I've been showing in other people's uh, presentation or, or their demonstration. Um, the CN actually can be done pretty quickly with our accelerator, but the, the CPU actually uh, sometimes bottleneck. So that's one of the, another problem that we are seeing. Again, it's highlighted the end-to-end -end performance is very critical. Um, in addition, uh, it's very important to handle the you know, data transfer because in the conventional architecture where we have a CPU plus uh, you know, accelerator, people have to spend a lot of effort to handling the data because the data have to move between different cores. So um, in the past work that people have proposed a different kind of a coherency um, technique to handle the, the, the data streaming of data movement between different cores. 
Um, anyway, that costs overhead and also make a design pretty complicated. And this is another reason we are trying to build something that is reconfigurable so that our data don't have to move between different cores. Okay, so um, here I want to highlight about you know the motivation that we do this work, uh, which is the fundamental difference between the two main you know computing vehicle nowadays we are using, which is uh, the the, the Van Neumann architecture that can do the general purpose computing and also, and then the DNN of the accelerator architecture or neuromorphic architecture that do the, you know, the, the neural network operation. So here you can show, uh, you can see we compare the CPU, GPU, and also the TPU. In terms of performance, of course, TPU will, you know, auto run and the CPU and the GPU because, you know, it's specially designed in terms of efficiency. However, uh, if you look at the number of instruction support, TPU only have less than 10 instructions. You can you know, play with, but CPU have, can go as high as a thousand in instructions. Uh, this is just highlighted the difference, right? And the highlight the trade-off. If you wanna be more flexible and support your programs, then you have to rely on the general purpose computing, but then you will suffer from the efficiency loss. So now our, motivation here is um, can we go from a different end of, our, of the you know the design space rather than starting with the CPU and somehow improve it or maybe push into accelerator space maybe we can start with the DNN architecture we know the DNN architecture is the most efficient architecture for performing the uh, deep learning job and then maybe we can incorporate the instruction support into the, the architecture to make it more flexible. And hopefully we can support the general purpose computing. And maybe that give us a better uh, you know, trade-off. So, so that's something uh, you know, motivates us to work on a new architecture. So uh, before I get on to our design, um, I wanna point, point out uh, uh, interesting work from Google two years ago. They published something called the neural ALU. So they try to use a modified neural network to train the neural network and uh, perform the ALU operation. And we, we all know ALU is the you know, central computing module inside the, um, uh, um, uh, inside the CPU, right? So um, they slightly modified the typical, you know, you know um, uh, the typical neural network by changing the activation layer and add a special training um, uh, function into it. So then they show that they, they can successfully train their neural network to, to, um, to behave like ALU. This is interesting, right? We, 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 people haven't tried to you know, use the neural network work to do what the, the, the general purpose type of computing. And we, we take this, we, we, we map that into hardware. And here to show how you look like. The conventional ALU is really, really tiny, right? We can do very efficiently. But if we really do the neural network, the size is much bigger. Um, so this is saying, actually, um, there's an issue of uh, you know, inefficiency if you just use the neural network to do the, um, do the general purpose computing. And also, there, we find some challenge in performing you know, train, train, to train it to do multiple different uh, tasks. Um, however, I think this is a very interesting, you know, direction to look into because these days there's so much development in the machine learning space, in the deep learning space that we find it can do a lot of jobs that we need. So then why can we, so is it possible that we try to reconcile the two end of the computing, you know, support uh, uh, and uh, maybe start with, with neural network and see if we can generate something more unified architecture that allow us to support the general purpose computing. And that's what, you see, the motivation of our work. So uh, here I show, basically I, I'm jumping into our technical details of this work now. Um, so what do we call it? Uh, we propose the, is uh, reconfigurable. Uh, we call it neural CPU. Because really, the baseline architecture is a is a neural um, is a neural uh, neural network accelerator. So rather than uh, what do we do uh, on the left of the slide, as you can see, rather than uh, using the conventional two-core system where you have a CPU plus accelerator, we 
combine them, and we start with a neural um, neural network accelerator. And in this case, very simple um, binary neural neural network. And we reconfigure it, and uh, we try to recover the instruction support. And we can reconfigure it to do the RIS-5 uh, operation. So the benefit of that is shown in here on the bottom of the slide. We can merge the two cores into a single core. And this single core, by the way, maintain the efficiency of both, both uh, different uh, both cores. So we can reduce our cost and the area, which is important for you know, the low, low power devices. And also we can, um, since we can do dual function in each core, if you use two cores, then we can really fully utilize our CPU or our accelerator. And then we can get very high, almost 100% core utilization rate. And this is actually, I will show later, we can significantly improve the latency. Um, on the other hand, because it is a very, you know, um, uh, this is a combined architecture, so the, the data actually stay locally. We don't have to try to transfer the data across different cores. So that reduces the data transfer overhead. So here shows our baseline structure, as I'm showing here in comparison between the, the, the RIS-5 um, architecture and also the, 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 the BN uh, neural network archetype, uh, accelerator. So uh, we use we take the the the, the risk five base instruction set. So that's the the most basic uh, um, um, basically risk five instruction set. And uh, in the BN architecture, we took a very simple BN which came from um, um, published in the VSI in the seventeen, um, which basically have multiple pipeline. Uh, 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 it have pipeline the BN um, uh, structure, so it cover different layers, and also each layer have a, a few hundred neurons. By the way, the the, the B in the BN uh, the neuron only do the XOR operation, so there's no multiplier in it. Uh, we see a great similarity between these two architecture, and that's one of the reason we pick these two architecture because the BN architecture also are relatively simple and also have a pipeline structure. So we, we basically, we try to reconfigure our available neurons to perform the pipeline um, operation so that we can do the dual purpose operation. So here is our baseline VN architecture. It has four neural layers. Each layer have about 100 uh, binary neurons. And each neuron has uh, um, this, this amount of available logics, including XOR, um, XNOR gate, either and also flip flops. So fortunately, we can actually quite well uh, reconfigure it using this available logic to recover the pipeline operations. So in the following slides, I'll show a little bit detail of what we did, but uh, um, I'll, I'll just try to stay at high level and you can, you can check our paper for our implementation. So um, the first stage is we try to recover the, you know, the instruction fetch stage and also the, the program counter. So we reuse the adders inside the neurons and some logic in the neurons um, and recover the PC calculation and also instruction fetch in the first layer. And then we uh, recover the, the instruction, uh, the ID of the, of the instruction decoder layer by using the neuron the, the basically the one layer of the neural network. In fact, this layer is the most, the, the easiest way to reconfigure because essentially the neural network also is just a sort of a decoder. So we pretty much can just reuse all the logic available in our neural network to perform the instruction decoding job. And we use the weight and also instruction code and to generate the instruction, the, the decoded instruction, um, in, in, in instruction codes to pipe into the following stages. So this is actually a very, and, and we have very high utilization of the, the, the neurons in, in this layer. Um, and then for execution also, because of the, uh, the execution, the neural network also do the execution. So this is also a pretty straightforward implementation that we can re reconfigure our neurons to perform all the, all the required arithmetic um, operation inside the ALU like add, sub, multiplication, 
And we add a little bit of Boolean support because the original neural network doesn't have the Boolean logic. So we add a few uh, logic gate into it, but the cost is very, very low. Uh, so that in that case, we can re re recover the, um, the ALU operation inside the, in, inside the neural network layer. And the final, the, uh, final uh, memory write back and the register write back is very simple. So a lot of time we just bypass the logic. Uh, beyond the reconfiguring the computing element, we also reconfigure the memory because we don't want to duplicate it. So, um, so in the uh, BN operation mode, we configure our SRAM into the, the weight SRAM and also the uh, also the image SRAM, and and so this is, so we use the cache on chip cache for the SRAM uh, for the weight and the and the instruction uh, and the image. Um, cache. And in the CPU mode, we reconfigure the, the cache into the data cache and also instruction cache. So then our memory actually also become dual purpose. There's a small amount of memory not used in either mode and also small amount of logic not used in either mode. We perform very extensive uh, cloud gating to gate off those one that's not in use so that we don't uh, waste uh, our power. Um, we also develop a special scheme to switch the mode because our idea is uh, we want to use one single core to perform both CPU and uh, you know, neural network. In that case, if you want to switch between different modes, there could be a time you have to spend on reloading the memory, right? So what we try to do is we try to uh, we develop a zero latency mode switching that allow us to switch the mode without even wait. So what do we do is right before we switch the mode, for example, between before we switch from CPU mode and switch into BN mode, we pre just a few seconds earlier we preload the first layer of the weight of the neural network, and then we then we can start the neural network operation immediately, and then and then we um, we can while we are executing the first layer, we can continue to load the second layer of weight and third layer of weight into and through our DMA on the chip. And then we can continue to do the streaming. And after we finish again, right before we switch mode, the operation, we uh, uh, we, we, we already finished uh, a few layers. So we have an empty uh, cache available. So we load our instructions and the data cache, uh, the data cache value into those uh, memory. And then we can smoothly uh, switch back into CPU mode and perform the, the, the operation. So effectively, our core utilization improved from 39% to almost 100%. So basically we can keep our hardware busy all the time. We also customized a few instructions from the RISC-V ISA extension to assist us to do the mode switching. Um, so help us, for example, keep track of uh, how many cycles we need to do for the uh, switching and uh, where to load, to send the memory and content into it. And keep in mind that we, our data all stay local. We don't transfer into another core. So um, we uh, basically allow, so we can directly reuse the data uh, after finish the pre-processing from the CPU. So to demonstrate that we actually fabricated our chip and this is our chip, uh, um, uh, our chip uh, topology here. And uh, to demonstrate the benefit of doing this, we build a two core system. So we can test a single core. Also, we can test the two core case in, in here. So uh, we use the CT5 nanometer technology. So keep in mind it's a, a relatively mature technology. So the performance uh, actually limited by technology we use. Um, it's running at the uh, speed uh, close to one gigahertz. And, and have a power about 100 to 200 milliwatts power in this small chip that we built. Um, first of all, I, this, this slide shows the baseline you know, performance of this chip. The, uh, the, the BN mode uh, consume more power than the CPU mode, um, of course. And in terms of the BN performance, we are, um, I wouldn't say we are state of art, um, mainly because of the limitation of technology, but we are in line with uh, a lot of other people's demonstration of the BN accelerator. 
I think the first question sh we should ask is how much overhead we have to pay to you know establish this kind of reconfigurability. So and so here, here showing the overhead interval area and speed. Uh, interval area uh, because our baseline is, is our is a BN accelerator. So interval area in overall we have a 2.7 percent increase of area uh, because of the additional logic we add to support the CPU operation. Uh, in the speed, again, because of the additional logic and speed degraded by about four to five percent. So uh, keep, keeping in mind that this, this small degradation still allow us to you know, maintain the efficiency of our, you know, the, the BN accelerator. So that's the area and also the speed. And then in terms of power, so the, in the PBN mode inference job, our power increased about 5.8%. Uh, again, this is a small increase. And, but in the CPU mode, our power increased by 14 to 15%. This is mainly because you know, CPU is still relatively smaller than the accelerator. And by adding those logic, we still have to pay some overhead. Okay, so that is the areas uh, speed and the power overhead. Then the question is, uh, what benefit did you get out of it? In fact, we can get even paying this small overhead, we can get a lot of benefit out of this reconfigurable architecture. So I'll show the benefit in the next few slides. Uh, first of all, uh, in terms of area saving, you can replace our you basically you can re replace the conventional two core system now with a sim single core, because our sim single core can do both jobs with similar efficiency as both cores there. Um, so you can do that with a sim simple single core CPU because otherwise your accelerator job will be really, really terrible, right? So uh, if you just build a single core system, then we can get a 35% of area saving. That's a cost reduction. And that is important for, um, you know, for the uh, for this, uh, IoT type of low cost device. Uh, in terms of energy saving, uh, yeah, we pay energy overhead because we are running, you know, a little, a little bit of overhead in it at high voltage. But at very, very low voltage, when we push into sub-threshold region, uh, as you all know that at that very low voltage, actually the leakage start to dominate the, the power consumption. And in that case, actually, we even get some energy saving because we our chip is smaller. So we actually, we have less power uh, leakage power consumption. That's another interesting point in here. Now, um, if you want to do a two core system, um, basically we can build a two N uh, CPU core into our processor. In that case, we, we see even better or even bigger benefit of building this kind of reconfigurable architecture. So the benefit actually come down to the higher core utilization in the real time application. So here I'm showing in the cases that we see that uh, in the real time application, uh, you still have to go sequentially with the image and another image and then uh, use the CPU to do the pre-processing and then use the accelerator to finish the classification job. And because the unbalance of the job between CPU and the, and the accelerator, um, we see that BN, uh, the accelerator stay idle and that's where the, the problem is. And so in in end-to-end -end performance, you suffer. In our case, we can basically configure the the two cores into both the CPU mode and finishes the CPU operation, and then switch both into the BN mode and and finish the job. And and then we can get a quite a significant speed up using our system. And and we demonstrated that using two cases, and um, both of them very simple. You know, a case, but it's suitable for the real-time application. Why is the for the image classification? We use the MNIST database, and you still have to do a certain amount of uh, pre-processing with CPU, such as uh, you know resizing the picture, uh, normalization of the pixels, and filtering of the the images. So that's done by the CPU, and then we pass pass into BN to do the inference. And we also demonstrate that using our rehab application that I presented it earlier for the, you know, the people who lost their limb, they, we have to uh, classify their EMG signal. So we have EMG sensor and then we do the feature extraction using CPU. 
which is where we track the mean, the variance, histogram, a lot of different features, and then pass into the classifier. Um, so in both cases, we see the CPU actually performs CTU 70% of the runtime, which means the CPU actually are quite significant in, in here. Um, so here shows the power tracing. We trace the power, so which can show the sequence of operation. In, we, and we, we have our you know, two-core system, so we can mimic the conventional setup. We can turn one, into, one core into CPU, the other one into the BN. And you can see that we, the CPU are, keep, are kept busy because we, we finish one image and do another image. But the, the BN actually have some idle time because it's waiting for the CPU to finish. Now, in our case, we can, pure, we can parallel both cores and do the CPU job first and then do the image job next, then we see improvements of 43% in the overall performance. And here shows the baseline comparison. So our baseline is CPU plus BN. So this is a two core system. If you only want to implement one single uh, newer CPU, then we see the performance uh, draw, um, basically uh, have a little bit of degradation about 5%. Why only 5%? Because again, uh, the CPU, uh, the BN are not fully utilized. But if you implement the two you know, core system, then um, we can get a 43%, 43% end-to-end performance improvement. And equivalently, that's even 74% energy saving if you lower the voltage and, and reach that performance level. So this is highlight uh, basically the benefit of the system in term in term of the you know end to end performance, which is very important for the real time system. Okay, so before I switch gear, I want to just summarize this work. So uh, we propose a very I would say very unique you know architecture, which is somehow sit you know between these two general purpose computing and the, you know specialized the computing, and we show the benefit in the real time application as I'm, I, I have pointed out. But we have to acknowledge that this is just a very small trial into a huge design space. Because I think many of you probably will raise the question, this baseline BN is very simple, and our baseline risk 5 is also very simple. So what is about the, um, putting that into a bigger CN accelerator? I, my simple answer is yes, actually we can do it. We spend some time uh, looking into that. Uh, and uh, we think that's totally possible. We can expand this method into a bigger accelerator, but the design space is very large and depends on the need. There's, you know, a big space, a big different, uh, you know, configure um, setting for the accelerator, also a, a big design space for the for CPU. So you have to find a balance point uh, to justify it, right? And we are looking into that right now. But But anyway, I think the work uh, lead to an interesting direction. That is, can we explore to use a DN type of you know, um, neural network architecture to perform general problem computing? And this is my wish for thinking, maybe there's an architecture that's sitting you know, between the Van Neumann architecture and the neuromorphic architecture to allow us to get the benefit of the both you know, computing vehicles. And I hope, and this is going be even beyond the engineering world. I think even, even in computer science, we can study that. Can we do the use of deep neural network to do the you know, CPU type of job? So that's the, um, the work I want to present in our very first uh, uh, topic. Now, um, now I'm going to switch gear to our second topic, which is at the circuit level. And, and, and uh, um, I'll try to uh, you know, stay at a high level to save the time. So at circuit level, what do we try to do is we try to leverage very special, you know, analog signal computing to uh, again accelerate the modern deep learning tasks. So uh, here I, I just give a quick summary because over the past two or three years, so we have developed many accelerators using the analog signal computing, right? Uh, so um, on left we published a work on, you know, uh, using a time-based computing to perform a dynamic time warping for time series analysis. And we show actually very uh, significant improvement over you know, conventional CPU, GPU, and even ASIC chip. And in the middle, we, uh, last year, we presented a, a time domain GAN accelerator and to, you know, to do all the, even the training in the analog mix you know, domain, which is extremely difficult. 
and we also show some benefit of doing that. And on the right, we uh, it, uh, the right part is our very recent work, which we'll present next month. Um, we, we build a special dynamic type of analog RAM for accelerated uh, compute in memory um, job. And we also show a pretty good performance. So I'll focus on this work. Um, so without giving you know more introduction, as we all know, the deep learning requires huge computing power. And uh, in the commercial setting, as we, we, what I, I can see on the, we can see on the screen, uh, we typically have a you know a global memory that serve as intermediate memory between the off-chip DRAM and also the on-chip computing element, which is the PE array. And the computing job are normally done in the PE array for the uh, for the CN operation, right? And uh, even you scale up the PE array, we see that the, the PE operation and also the, the data movement across this memory hierarchy dominate our overall power consumption. And, and this inspired the operation that, uh, you know, people to build the computer in memory accelerators. So on the left side of this uh, uh, slide, we see the traditional CNN accelerator where you have a real mic unit and a memory and the data keep transferring between them, you know, um, so that create a, you know, some loss of efficiency. And in the computing memory, we kind of uh, mingle, you know, the, the computing unit with the memory together. So now the mic operation are inside the memory of typically a SRAM array. And by leveraging the analog computing inside the SRAM, we can get very high efficiency in the PE power. And also because of the, the data don't have to travel between the computing unit and the memory, we can save the, the, the energy loss through the data movement. On the right, this is a, a last year's demonstration that people did um, from Tsinghua. They built a, a, a CM micro, we should do the CM operation and have a supporting global memory to save all the weight activation and also ASIC. So typically people put this um, uh, compute in memory into a macro uh, with the limited size and then you can put many tiles and the macro look just like SRAM bank. Okay, so here, uh, this slide shows a few existing uh, demonstration on live days that last year's uh, TSMC's work in the seven nanometer. On the right is the one I pointed out from Jinghua in the, um, again, this is a computing mem uh, in memory micro. The left side is more just a micro demonstration, but on the right, people even show the whole system design using the micro. Uh, what do we see in common? And that's pro probably, I think all the, so far, uh, all the demonstration is basically they incorporated the micro operation into the SRAM array and the mic operation actually ha happened with an uh, additional two transistors uh, of SRAM. So this is a typical SRAM, you add two more transistors. So to build eight transistor SRAM, and this, uh, this transistor allow you to uh, send the, you know, the weight information into the bit line voltage and the mic operation happening on the bit line voltage in the analog way. So, and after you finish that, you convert the analog voltage into a uh, through ADC and back into a, uh, into ASIC to do some post-processing. So that's a, the typical setup. And AT transistor uh, SRAM are typically used in this computing memory design. And one issue we see in this kind of design is the bitwise operation because every single bit is only represent one bit, right? Every single SRAM cell only represent one bit. So if you want to deal with eight bit or four bit, you have to uh, uh, find a way to combine the bitwise operation which require the recombination job in the digital domain and need the multiple pulses, which cause the efficiency loss in, in, in this kind of CM operation. So here I summarize a, a lot of, a, a few uh, limitation of existing work, including the area limitation because people all use 70, uh, 60, 80 SRAM. But in our design that I'm gonna show later, we use much aggressively. We only use three T transistor uh, SRAM. Um, on the right side, there's also issue of linearity of the input encoding and the multiple phase recombination to generate, you know, to support the larger number of bits uh, and matching issues of capacitor and also ADC. In fact, ADC dominate the power consumption. 
So, so we have to find a way to improve the ADC as well. So the one very first question which motivated us to do this work is, can we even further cut down number of transistor in a cell rather than using 8P? And uh, we found out that this is actually possible because even if we say that weight is stationary, the weight only stay in a limited cycles inside your isoram, uh, inside your isoram micro because the weight for any model, a CN model is huge. And our limit, our micro have a limited size. So you have to replace the weight to, to perform continuous calculation. In that case, that means that we have a limited life cycle of our station weight into the CM micro. And this gives us the opportunity to use the dynamic circuit and stay there for a short period of time and, and to perform the CN operation. And then we, 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 can, we can either refresh or, 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 or replace. So this gives us a chance to further condense our circuit design using dynamic analog memory, which I've, I'll show later, we have much less number of transistors for this computing memory um, support. And also because we have multiple bit inside each memory, we can remove the bit by the recombination, which will make our work simpler, faster, and also higher efficiency. So this slide shows our proposal design where we um, replace the AT SRAM into uh, only three transistors. And we save the analog weight, uh, a four bit analog weight into a sing single uh, capacitor. So this is a, kind of, in a way, similar to a DRAM kind of uh, transistor, but, uh, uh, but we are analog. So we save multiple bit information into this simple, uh, simple capacitor. And our transistor count reduced by 10 times as shown here. And also we propose uh, quite a few, you know, technology, uh, a technique to leverage the sparsity in the analog space, which people have not done before. And uh, we can achieve state-of-art efficiency for the CNN operation. Um, the operation of the single cell is actually similar to what people do in the SRAM-based CM, where we send in the pulse and the, the pulse represents the input activation uh, value. Um, in the, our case, the, the native support is four bit, uh, represented the pulse width. And the current of the transistor, read the transistor, is uh, basically linearly proportional to the weight you save on here as an analog voltage. So then the multiplication is simply the pulse, the time, times the current, which is the weight. So we can do the mic, the multiplication job as uh, uh, inside the mic using this simple distribution discharging operation of the B-line voltage. And if you have multiple, and, and in a typical array, we have multiple of them uh, in each column sharing the B-line, then we can do the basic accumulation job. So the MAC operation actually are, are replaced by the simple analog you know, discharge operation. Um, so this is how to do the MAC in, the, in, in our array. And in the right operation, um, well, this, this is our microarray where we have a you know, mixing node component in it. We have a, a DTC, which convert the digital into time pulse. We have an ADC convert the voltage in, back, into, uh, back into digital domain. And we have DAC to write the analog voltage. So our write process takes uh, about 64 cycles to finish. And our read process, which is the you know, MAC inference job, uh, we first pre-charge the beta line voltage to high and then we send the activation pulse through DTC, and then uh, the bit line will discharge, and the bit line voltage is uh, the MAC result, and then we pass through the 5 bit SAR ADC to convert into digital, and, and the ASIC will perform some post-processing. Some challenges we are faced with, is one is very obvious, we have the retention issue, because we know this kind of dynamic RAM cannot stay there forever. So we have, we have to deal with the sub leakage from the transistor <clears throat> and also the gate leakage from the transistor. So we have, uh, we specially designed it. We also have uh, some biasing technique to reduce the sub leakage by 20 times. And the sizing, even though there are three transistors, the sizing are, are tricky so that you have to balance between the retention, the write time, and also the, the, the process variation of the devices. We built a special um, capacitor, uh, basically metal capacitors on top of the, the, the cell to enhance the capacitance of the, the cell so that we can stay longer time. 
Um, um, by the way, we use a regular logic transistor. We don't have access to DRAM technology. We also don't have a, access to the foundry uh, SRAM transistor. So everything is just regular a logic transistor here. Uh, by using a special uh, you know, a metal capacitor, without the increasing the footprint, we can increase the retention time by three times. Here we show the area improvement. Overall, we reduced the area by 50% um, compared to the previous 80 uh, CM cell. And in terms of retention time, we can retain uh, about 40 thousand cycles in typical corner and the 5,000 cycles in fast corner. This will support the five to 40 images without any refresh operation, right? For a lot of time, this is probably uh, uh, um, uh, enough for our season operation. Um, even if we have to spend time for doing the, you know, refresh operation, we can, our overhead is very small because 64 cycles out of a few thousand cycles run, a few tens of thousands run is very small. So our overhead is only less than uh, about 1%, depending on which corner you're at, at. And the energy overhead is only, you know, point some percent because the overhead of writing into it is very small. Uh, there's a, also a um, special circuit technique to compensate the linearity loss um, due to the IV curve of the, of the transistor. I'm, I'm gonna go a little bit faster, sorry, I'm a little over time. This is our whole uh, CN accelerator design. We have the micro, as I'm explaining here, and also we have ASIC to handle the data transfer between the global um, um, memory and into the micro. So our um, our ASIC perform some data, data movement, also pre post processing that needed, and also some sparsity enhancement in here. In terms of sparsity, we do pretty simple. We actually, we do input sparsity. So we detect the, the value of input. If it's zero, we just disable the, the DTC and also uh, the MAC operation. We also leverage some uh, analog sparsity. So essentially, um, I'm gonna show that a little bit later. So we use analog sparsity to skip ADC to reduce the cost. And that's also handled by the AC core. So one example of uh, analog sparsity is our MAC operation, uh, the MAC result is in analog domain. And this is the result in a lot of calculations actually have very little voltage on it. Then we don't act activate the ADC every cycle. We detect the ADC, the MAC value. If, it, if you have sufficient room, then we like to continue to do accumulation in the bit line voltage. And then after we reach a certain level, then we activate the ADC. This operation allow us to actually skip 65% of ADC operation, which have lead to a significant amount of you know, saving in terms of the, the, the energy. We also do a ReLU-based ADC skipping. The idea is if our accumulation becomes so negative that we know, you know passing through the ReLU, the result will be zero, then we just skip the rest of the operation. That actually helps reduce the amount of calculation we need and also the ADC operation. Uh, we also have a weight shifting technique. I think I'll skip this one. This is related to our analog uh, design. We try to like, improve the, the, uh, uh, the energy efficiency. We build a test chip in, here, in, uh, again, in the CT5 nanometer, low power technology. It, uh, uh, speed is running about 100 megahertz, mainly limited by our ADC. And na natively, we support the four bit. And we, but we can extend to eight bit by combining multiple cells and running multiple cycles. We achieve a efficient uh, accuracy of around 90% for the typical models that people run. Um, we tested the retention. We can retain uh, within about 0.3 milliseconds without refresh and without seeing accuracy loss. But if you stay longer, you start to see the loss of accuracy because of the drifting of the, uh, you know, of the memory content. But we can activate the, the refresh, and the refresh only incur about 0.2% of the um, of the overhead. We measured our efficiency. We actually got a quite a state of art result. We um, first of all, our sparsity uh, technique improved the efficiency by two times, and our micro efficiency about 100 TL per watt, and with sparsity about 200. This is quite a state of art compared to to one demonstrated in the in the similar technology. 
And our system efficiency, including the ASIC and the memory, uh, give us about 40-40 ops per watt. And um, <clears throat> by the way, all of them are at the four-bit calculation. Uh, here showing and uh, compare with the previous work, the most closest work is uh, published last year. Um, this one has a system demonstration similarize us. Our transistor count reduced by 10 times. Our area reduced by three times. Our efficiency improved by four to eight times, actually. So the main, the improvement mainly come from, you know, uh, we, we do four bits all at the same time, rather than going with a bit by bit operation as demonstrated by the previous CM operation. All right, so at this point, I want to quickly summarize my talk here. Um, so I told my student, actually the AI bring a lot of excitement into the hardware development. Um, because, the, because the AI have so many different application space and different algorithm. So we can explore a large space in terms of you know, architecture design and also circuit design. And also because the AI can tolerate certain accuracy or the error in your computing, we can explore something that we wouldn't do in the past. So this give uh, us a lot of interesting development. But what I want to mention is the end-to-end -end performance is very important. So um, in the real-time operation, you can we, we need to use the DN, but we can't just focus on the DN. We also need a CPU to uh, do the job. And so that's why we want to develop some new architecture that allow us to do both, you know, both type of the computing. Uh, jobs. And this is the, one of the work we are working on now. So at this point, I want to give a, a acknowledgement to our founding agency, that is NSF, DARPA, SRC. And uh, thank you so much uh, for attending this talk. I know we can't see each other, and we, we can talk face to face, but uh, um, the technology has made so much improvement and uh, we can do it quite efficiently online. And I uh, hope everyone of you stay healthy and enjoy this time with your family, right? We don't have much opportunity to stay 24 hours with our family. So I hope you all enjoy your time and uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.